Our next witness wishes to be known as Graham, does he? That's right. Graham, please. I do solemnly, sincerely. I do solemnly, sincerely. And truly declare and affirm. And truly declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Graham, you have severe haemophilia A. That's correct. And when, were you, when you were young, how often did you need treatment? Um, I think it varied. Um, from speaking to my mother, uh, as a sort of young child, uh, I was at the hospital maybe as a maximum frequency once a week, uh, but it could maybe be sometimes once, twice a month. And what treatment did you receive? Uh, factor 8. Did you ever receive um, cryoprecipitate? No. You were treated in Dundee? Yes. Was there a haemophilia centre there? No. Uh, as I understand it, the haemophilia service in Dundee was largely quite disorganised during the 1980s. Uh, it wasn't until the arrival of Philip Cahia in 1991 that the centre was established. Um, prior to that, the, I believe it was certainly as a paediatric, I just went into a general uh, paediatric clinic. There was no specialist paediatric haemophilia clinic no. that you could attend? No, I remember quite clearly going to the, the paediatric clinic. Uh, it was in a, a downstairs corridor in Nine Wells and there was sort of cartoon characters and things on the walls. And I quite enjoyed going because there was a playroom and there was a games console and things like that. But I remember my mum sort of sitting in the waiting room talking to other parents of children who had other conditions, uh, not necessarily haemophilia. And your understanding is that throughout <coughs> your childhood you only ever received Scottish factor products? That's correct. Um, why, why is that? Well, again, I believe largely because Tayside or uh, Dundee was quite disorganised in terms of its haemophilia service, um, that there was no oversight from a director in terms of uh, procurement. Uh, so all supplies by default came from the SNBTS lab in Dundee. And that's what you've been told subsequently, that that's what was happening? Yeah, I think we've established that previously, but I've also been told that again recently. In 1985, you now understand you were tested for HIV. Yeah. Can we have 2192006, please, Paul? It's a letter uh, from January 1985, which says that you attended a special clinic for haemophiliacs on the 11th of January arranged along with uh, another doctor so that the problem of AIDS could be explained. A sample of blood was removed from Graham for antibodies to the AIDS virus, HTLV3, and the sample will be sent to Edinburgh along with others obtained at the same time from other haemophiliacs. And then there's some discussion about hepatitis B. As far as you're aware, did your mum attend such an appointment? Um, I obviously don't remember it. I would have only been five years old at the time, but uh, I've spoken to my mum uh, and my dad about it. They have no recollection at all of this special clinic. Um, they believe if this did happen, it would have been dressed as a, a standard haemophilia checkup. Um, but they, they have no recollection of it whatsoever. Um, as a parent myself, I think if I was asked to come in and have my child tested for AIDS, um, I would remember it, and my parents have no recollection of this whatsoever. Do they have any re recollection of being told the result of that test? No. In 1992, you changed factor products. What were you told about that? Um, I don't have a great recollection of it, but um, essentially I was moving to a new product, which was better, I believe it was a higher purity, um, it would be better for my haemophilia care, but nothing else was really told other than this is what we're moving to, this will be for your benefit. Can we have 2192004, please? And it's a letter from August 1992, and towards the end of the first paragraph, it uh, says, I've also spoken to them about the change in the factor eight, 
Scottish blood transfusion are going to be changing over to highly purified factor eight in September, and this will require all the children to be changed over at that time. Because it as yet only has a provisional licence, it will require that those who are being changed over should be monitored carefully, and I've explained this to the parents. Do you know, either from your own knowledge or from talking to your parents, what was be meant by being monitored carefully? Well, we understood it to be that they were just going to be checking my inhibitor levels and the effectiveness of the treatment. Uh, we didn't expect that there would be any sort of virology checks um, as a result of changing over to the new treatment. In late 1994, early 1995, when you were about 15, your mum became concerned about the possibility that you might have been infected with the virus through the blood products you'd been receiving. What did she do about that? Um, my mum had been, I think, getting increasingly suspicious or aware of the sort of the rumours circulating about hepatitis C. Um, up until that point, she hadn't really inquired about it because she actually thought that the SNBTS products were safe. Um, all the stuff that she had seen in the news or in the literature that, that came out um, seemed to be focused on down south, or certainly what she saw. Uh, it was an English problem. So she hadn't been concerned up until that point. But I think um, over the course of 1994, Possibly other haemophiliacs in the area had maybe tested positive and mum attended the local groups. And I think probably she was encouraged um, to find out if I could have been affected. So she approached uh, Dr Bilke, who was my paediatric uh, doctor at the time. And I think probably asked in quite an offhand kind of way. Um, there's no chance that Graham might have been affected by this, is there? And I think it was probably left at that. And that was, that was just as part of an, a routine checkup. And then, if we can have 2192008, please, Paul. We can see a letter from January 1995 to your mum and dad saying, I've now gone through and looked at Graham's results of his viral studies, and in fact, he does have a positive hepatitis C antibody test, which means <coughs> that at some stage he's been exposed to hepatitis C. Obviously, there's a lot of press coverage about this at the moment. We obviously need to talk about this matter when he next comes to the clinic. Did, did your mum go in and talk to Dr Wilkie about this? I believe she contacted Dr Wilkie the very same day and arranged a meeting. And what was she told? Uh, I think she was, was invited to come in for a meeting with my dad. I don't think I was invited... Uh, or I was excluded in some way. Um, so she did attend the meeting, uh, possibly it was about a couple of weeks later. We've got a letter from February 1995. Um, <coughs> uh, it's 2192002. And we can see that it, the purpose of the meeting was to discuss the fact that you were hepatitis C positive. Uh, and the letter says in the second paragraph... <coughs> I think the important thing I've emphasised is that most people with hepatitis C positive may not have actual active disease, and we have to determine this in Graham, and we'll organise an ultrasound scan and liver function tests done on a three-monthly basis to see whether, in fact, there is evidence of ongoing liver involved. At this stage, we'll then need to go on to discuss whether liver biopsy would be an alternative to determine whether he has active liver disease or not. And if we carry on down the page... Uh, it says, I think the parents were quite relieved in chatting about the situation today, but it's still a rare occurrence for people with hepatitis C positivity to go on to end-stage liver failure. Does that accord with what you think your parents were told at that time? Uh, they certainly were not relieved. Um, when I received my notes and saw this letter, uh, I showed it to my parents, and uh, I think they... Not quite, it's not funny, but they were almost rolling about the floor laughing at the way it was worded. Um, you know, it's, they were not relieved in the slightest. Um, after having had that meeting, they were scared for the future and they didn't know really what it meant for me. What were <coughs> you told about the hepatitis C? Um, from my parents, I was told not to worry, that things would get sorted. I think they tried to calm me and reassure me. Um, you know, there would be treatments in the pipeline and everything would eventually be OK. I was also told not to tell anyone, uh, keep it to myself, because obviously there, at the time there was lots of uh, 
uh, stigma attached to it in terms of HIV, AIDS, uh, hepatitis. You know, they were all sort of diseases that were in the press at the time, um, and there was a lot of prejudice. Did you have any discussion with the doctors about it? I don't recall at that stage, no. And how do you feel now about that delay in telling you or your mum? So that's from the test in 1992 until the letter when I received in 1994. Very angry about it. Um, you know, if they knew in 1992, why didn't they tell us in 1992? Um, it either means somebody withheld that information from us or somebody wasn't checking my results. Uh, either way, it, it shouldn't have happened. Um, you know, and if they hadn't checked my results, why were they testing me in the first place? So it does point to the fact that they, they probably withheld the information from me. And subsequently, you've been concerned that if your mum hadn't asked in 1995, when you when, would have When she told. would have eventually told, yeah, yeah, exactly. When you were told about the diagnosis and you were told not to tell anyone, mm. what did you understand the diagnosis to mean for you? That I was at the beginning of the end of my life. Um, you know, I felt that I had just been given a death sentence and, um, you know, that I was only 15. Um, I didn't really know what to do with it, if I'm honest. Um, I was very scared, but outwardly I was trying to be brave because I didn't want uh, my parents to see me upset. I wanted them to... They had been through the, the mill enough with my haemophilia. Um, I didn't want them to sort of think that I was, I was scared for my future. I wanted them to see me still as a positive uh, teenager uh, with a bright future. So I bottled it up and I put it away and tried to carry on regardless. And did you talk to your parents much at all about it? Or was it something that you... Uh, very little. I talked to them if they asked me anything, but uh, I didn't go to them about anything. And you've said that you had been told not to tell anyone about it. What was the impact of that at school and with your friends? Yeah, um, so nobody uh, during my school days found out. Um, it was a closely guarded secret. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm just going to refer to some of my notes because I'm clamming up a little bit and I've written everything down that I want to, to say. Yeah, so I mean, I was at school. Um, the actual day that the letter arrived in 1995, um, I was actually going into school that morning um, for a prelim exam. And I remember going up to school thinking, what's the point? Uh, you know, I don't need to try for exams anymore because I'm going to be dead in a few years. Um, I kept it secret from my friends because I was told to. Um, because my mum and dad were worried about people with maybe... They, they weren't so much worried about my friends, but they were worried about other boys and girls that maybe didn't know me very well, uh, possibly picking on me. And thankfully, I never got out, so it, it never really happened. And what was the impact on your schooling, on your academic uh, uh, progression? I think I did OK. Uh, <laughs> I got enough... You know, I was, I was a fairly diligent kid. Um, I did enough to get through all my exams. You know, I, got some decent higher results and managed to get to university and I got through university um, as well. Probably didn't do as well as what I should have done either at school or university, but that's because I think my mind wasn't really uh, into it as, as it should have been. You said in your statement you developed a carefree attitude uh, yeah. because you felt that what was the point of applying yourself particularly to education when you weren't going to be around in a few years? Absolutely. Uh, I was a teenager, I was immature, and that was the, the, the attitude that I adopted, you know, that if I'm going to be dead soon, then, you know, I might as well enjoy myself while I can. What's the point of applying myself to my studies? In 1999, you became involved in some possible legal action mm -hmm. relating to the hepatitis C. What were you told by your solicitors at that early stage to do? Yeah, they asked us to approach... Um, NHS Tayside and to find out um, if there had been any gap between me testing positive for hepatitis C and being informed. 
and I obviously subsequently got the, the letter through which said that I had tested positive in 92. We're going to look at that letter in just a moment. Yep. But do you have any idea of why your solicitors were asking you to do that? I believe it's possibly because they had other clients at the time who had also encountered a similar delay. Could we have 2192007, please? This is the reply you received in 1999, which says, just a note to confirm that you and your parents were first informed about you being hepatitis C positive in a letter on the 16th of January 1995. The first identification of hepatitis C antibody was in November 1992 as part of a general virological screen when you were changing factor VIII products. Had you been told, or your parents been told, in 1992 that you'd be having a general virological screen? Yes, that was part of changing the product. Um, but, no, sorry, they weren't told that there was a general virological screen. They were told that they would be doing some routine bods. That was the careful monitoring bit, yeah. but nothing about viruses. No. And so I take it from that you weren't aware that you were being tested for hepatitis C in 1992? Not at all, though. Once treatment options were discussed with you after your diagnosis, you had to wait for your first round of treatment. Yeah. Why was that? I think there was a mixture of... I did hear about sort of waiting for funding to come through. Um, but I also wonder um, if it was perhaps to let me get past my school days. Um, I don't really know the ins and outs of why it was, it was held off until that point, but I, I do remember uh, hearing about funding issues. So you had your first round of combination therapy in about 1998, 1999? Yeah. What impact did that have on you? I remember all the flu-like symptoms. Um, it was pretty awful. Uh, waking up every day, feeling like you had the flu and nothing you could do would shake it. Um, I was tired. Um, I remember things like headaches quite regular as well, but it, mainly the flu-like symptoms and tiredness. And at that time you were at university? Yeah. What effect did this have on your studies? Uh, it didn't stop me from attending, um, thankfully, because it was quite important that I got through the course. Um, but again, I don't think I applied myself as well as I could have done if I hadn't been on the treatment. That first round of treatment was unsuccessful. Correct. And then you had a second round in 2001. Mm. Why did that come to an end? Um, it wasn't working. So I was on the treatment for six months and I was told it's not working, it's very unlikely to work at this stage. Uh, and given that I was suffering from the side effects, that it was probably best to stop. By then, you were, you were still at the university, you were towards the end of your university yeah. course. Again, what was the impact of, of having the treatment on you? Similar. Um, I was unwell again. Uh, probably struggled a little more on the second time round. Uh, I lost a lot of weight. I remember I went to go on the, the nutritional milkshakes and things to try and keep my weight up. Um, it was pretty tough, but again, I was able to just about do enough at university to get through. It was probably fortunate that the course that I was doing was geography, uh, and it's something that I actually just have a background interest in anyway. So as much as um, I wasn't applying myself to the course in the way that I would have liked, uh, I was probably able to infer enough of my own background knowledge just to pad out what I was learning on the course. And um, I, think, I think at that point you'd also moved home again to have a bit of extra support during the treatment. Yeah, I think I'd gone back home to live with my parents, yeah. yeah. After university, you were offered a media job. Mm. What can you tell us uh, about that? Um, yeah, after I graduated, I was obviously looking for a career, and one of the things that had interested me was a, 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 this media job. Um, I attended for an interview. The interview went very well. Mm. Uh, so well, in fact, that it was more or less concluded that uh, we just need to send you for a medical, but that's a formality and uh, an offer will come out in the post afterwards. Um, so I went for the medical, I think it was a couple of days later. Um, I hadn't disclosed my haemophilia or hepatitis uh, at the interview or any in my application, but I didn't think it was going to be an issue. Uh, mm. But I went for the medical and 
when I was lying on the, the table, uh, the doctor, if he was doing the medical, happened to notice I had three small scars in my stomach area, which were from the um, over biopsy that I'd had when I was, uh, I think, 16, possibly. And obviously inquired as to what those scars were. Uh, and that's when I disclosed, obviously, that I had hepatitis C uh, as a result of my haemophilia. Um, a week or so passed, and the letter never came to offer the job. And I eventually got fed up waiting, and I phoned up and was told the job had been filled by someone else. How did you feel at that point? Devastated. Um, you know, I was really keen on the job, and I, I'd more or less been told that I had it. Um, and I was really looking forward to it. So I think I kind of knew after the, the medical that there might have been issues, but I kind of still hoped that I was going to get it. But it never happened, so I was, I was really upset. So what did you do after that in terms of work? Um, luckily, whilst I'd been at university, I'd had a, a summer job working in a, a shoe warehouse. Um, when I had finished university, they actually gave me a permanent part-time position working in the warehouse. Um, and they knew that I was looking for a proper career uh, to follow on from that. Um, luckily, I think it wasn't long after the, the rejection from the, the media job, um, they invited me to come through to the office and had a chat with me about possibly moving into a management position. Um, the stock controller of that company was due to retire within a year's time, and they needed somebody to to replace her, and they thought I'd be a good fit because they knew me from for four years, and they knew I had a degree and was looking for for a, a proper career. Um, I felt I'd be a good fit for them, so they made me an offer, and that's where I, I stayed then for uh, I think it was twelve years. By well, not long after that, you met your wife, and yeah. you married. We married in 2007, but we met not long after, yeah. sort of 2001, yeah. 2007, you got married, uh, and your wife was very keen to have children, yes. as, as were you, mm -hmm. but you waited for some time. Yeah. Can you tell us why? Um, ultimately, I was the one who kind of held off uh, more than my wife um, because of my hepatitis C status. Um, I didn't want to risk the possible transmission of hep C to my wife. Um, but we, we sort of, you know, I, I, was, I was absolutely petrified of actually passing it on. Um, and, you know, that's why we sort of held off and we held off and we held off. And it was ultimately sort of in 2011, 12 that we kind of felt can't really wait any longer. You were offered a third round of treatment and you deferred that. Yes. In order to start a family. Yes. Um, it was sort of coincidental that around about the time when my wife and I decided we couldn't wait any longer to start a family, that the, the next sort of round of treatment was made available. Um, we felt, because of the, the length of time that I would be on the treatment and the time you have to wait afterwards for getting pregnant, um, that it would be best that I deferred the treatment. Um, at this stage, I wasn't unwell from the hepatitis C, not noticeably anyway. Um, so the, the advice was that there was no rush to get started, um, so that there was time for us to start a family if that's what we wished to do. So the agreement was we would defer the treatment for a year uh, to allow us to start trying for a family. Um, it was getting touch and go, <laughs> um, so much so that we decided that actually we got involved with uh, freezing my sperm. Um, because we were getting worried that we weren't going to fall pregnant before I was due to start the treatment. Um, and in case of any complications, we wanted to still be able to... Uh, my wife wanted to be able to do the IVF, if need be, uh, whilst I was on the treatment. Um, luckily, we did fall pregnant just before I was due to, to start the next course of treatment. So your wife was pregnant, you started your third round of treatment. Yeah. This time the treatment was successful. Yes. But what were the side effects of that third round? Uh, pretty devastating again. I lost a lot of weight. Um, the, the main two symptoms were the weight loss, the flu, flu like symptoms again. Um, and I had a quite severe rash over lots of my body. 
And what symptoms have you been left with since then? I think I probably am fatigued some of the times. Uh, and I think it's peaks and troughs with that. I go through weeks where I think I feel quite good. And then there's a few weeks where I'm maybe below par. Um, I've definitely been left with the itchy skin. Um, you know, I just can't seem to shake that. Um, other than that, I don't think I've been left with too many symptoms. You're also concerned that the interferon treatment has made your ankle arthritis worse. That's correct, yes. Why is that? Well, that was actually through the uh, Scottish Infected Blood Support Scheme. Um, some of the information that, was, that I found when I was doing the application um, suggested that uh, interferon can exacerbate arthritis. Um, and that's why I kind of wonder whether that might have been the case with me. Um, my arthritis in my ankles has primarily been caused by bleeds from my haemophilia. Um, but I don't really remember the arthritis kicking in until sort of the early 2000s, which was not long after the two courses of interferon treatment. It may be coincidental, but it may not be. For you, the timing is, is pretty close to having started that interferon and the arthritis getting Correct. worse. Correct, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's the situation now with your liver? I believe I have minimal or no fibrosis based on the, the last sets of ultrasound scans that I, I had before the, the treatment. Um, so I'm hopeful that's still the case. Have you had any monitoring since completing the treatment? I've had liver function tests done for about a year afterwards, uh, which were all normal. But anything since then? No, not aware. It's been offered, but uh, I've declined. You said in your statement you're still very fearful, though, about your health. Yeah, I, I, the, the whole hep C thing has given me this sense that I, I was living with a ticking time bomb. Um, you know, I always wondered when it was that I was going to become unwell. Um, that stayed with me. Um, I still, I'm still concerned that I had hepatitis C for probably around about 30 years. And, you know, I wonder what damage has already been done to me. Uh, you know, that possibly the foundation stones have been laid for future ill health. Um, and it, it does make me fearful for the future and, and that my life may not be as long as what it should have been. And what's the effect been on your mental well-being of that? Yeah, um, I think I'm probably not as outgoing a person as I would have been um, if I hadn't had the diagnosis. Um, I do think I get irritable sometimes. My wife says I'm probably the most laid-back person she's ever met, but... Um, you know, I know that I get times where I feel very irritable and I kind of go into myself and I just need to take myself into a different room or away from the house or whatever and just have a few bit of time to myself. Um, it's, it's kind of difficult to say because I don't know what I was like before um, other than I was quite an outgoing kid. I, I feel like I became more reserved after the, the, the treatment came and more secretive. Um, one of the things that kind of sticks out for me is that my haemophilia was actually something I wore very proudly as a child. I was very outgoing and I talked about it all the time. I did demonstrations in a classroom, uh, did talks in the classroom about it. I even did a treatment demonstration where a couple of kids fainted in the class. Um, so, I mean, my haemophilia was something I was very proud of, strangely. Um, you know, it was a big part of who I was. When I got the, the hepatitis C diagnosis, it felt like almost a part of me kind of died because by association, the haemophilia became a dirty word and it was something I then had to hide away. Where I'd been very open about my haemophilia, um, it was now something that I hid away because I didn't want people to, to make the connection between haemophilia and hepatitis C. Um, so, yeah, that did affect me quite a lot and it still does. Uh, you know, I, to this day, I'm not very open with people about anything. To be honest, I, I keep a lot to myself. Describing your statement, um, being a closed door emotionally, yeah, and often feeling emotionally detached from reality and kind of flatline. Yeah, yeah, I don't get upset the way I should get upset about things which are distressing or upsetting. Um, I don't get the elation maybe that I should do when something really good happens. Um, I, I do feel like I'm just kind of on a level all the time. What's been the impact of the infection on your family life? Yeah, 
I don't, I don't, I'm not as affectionate as I should be, I don't think. Um, you know, kisses and cuddles for my kids and my, my wife don't come naturally. Uh, I really do have to work hard at it and remind myself that it's OK to do these things. Um, and I think that's partly as well that, you know, for many years I actually felt dirty and infectious. Um, you know, I didn't want to touch people. Um, I used to think, you know, that my sweat would be infectious, you know, and I had worried about touching light switches in case somebody else came along and touched it after me and got, got hep C. Um, you know, so it's definitely affected me. Um, don't get me wrong, I, I love my kids dearly and I think they know that as well, but, um, you know, I think I would have been a more affectionate and sort of cuddly kind of dad if, if that was the, if I hadn't had the, the hep C. And how has it affected your marriage? Um, you know, I'm, all, I'm very lucky in a way that Laura has known me um, since 2001, and she was one of the first people I actually probably, probably uh, really confided in about the hep C. So she's always known about it. Uh, so it's been a part of our relationship all the way through. Um, but I don't think it has helped. Um, you know, I've, I'm, as I say, I'm probably not as physically affectionate as what I should be. It's something I have to work hard at, and it's probably not as natural a um, physical relationship as it should be. Throughout this time, have you been offered any counselling or psychological support? Um, no, other than attending the usual haemophilia clinics. Um, are you OK? Is there anything you want to talk about? There's not been any sort of specialist uh, counselling offered. Do you think if there had been some offered, you would have taken it up? Um, I'm probably a typical guy in, in that, no, I probably wouldn't have. Uh, that's not to say that it shouldn't have been sort of pushed on me. Um, you know, I, one of the things I've sort of thought about with this is that, you know, if you're not hungry, you're not hungry. But if you pass a fish and chip shop, you'll all of a sudden be very hungry. Um, same with counselling. Uh, if it's there right in front of you and somebody starts the conversation, even if you didn't want that conversation, it might happen and it might start the outpouring of, of what you need to talk about. You've reflected in your statement that you think you probably would have benefited from counselling, certainly in the early days, yeah. even if you hadn't really wanted it. Correct, yeah. If it had been given to me and almost made compulsory, <laughs> I think it would have helped. In terms of your working life, during that third round of treatment, your daughter was born and you were made redundant. Yeah. Um, and you said the side effects were awful, yeah. but the impact of that situation with work was also very difficult yeah um, I was as you say I was more right in the midst of the treatment um, I my daughter was due to have been born on the 26th of December and I'd actually taken two weeks off work with the idea that I would have paternity leave to follow on after that um, so I was off work uh, over new Christmas and new year and um, I think it was on the <laughs> my daughter still hadn't been born um, but it was around about the 5th of January. I got a phone call from work to say that the, the business was closing down. Um, and, you know, that obviously they started the consultation process about redundancy. Um, and then my daughter was born on the 10th of January, five days later. Um, it was very difficult. I was in a, a bit of a mess. Um, but I had to put a brave face on it because my wife had been very unwell during her pregnancy as well. Um, so she needed my support. And, you know, I wasn't well enough to really give as much as I sh would have liked to have done. Um, the redundancy thing, I kind of really just put that to the back of my mind um, because I had bigger things to deal with. Uh, I could worry about work later, but it was still a considerable thing to have to deal with. And then when you did come to worry about work, mm -hmm. what did you go on to do? Um, I was fortunate that... Um, whilst I'd been working at the, the shoe factory, I'd also kind of had... Uh, some promotions and I'd become sort of the e-commerce manager uh, during that time and um, I'd worked quite closely with another local media company who had developed our, our website and um, on hearing about the redundancy I gave them a phone call just to ask if they had anything that they might be able to offer me and they jumped at the chance they, they offered me a job there and then on the phone um, so luckily that situation resolved itself very easily and quite quickly um, yeah. And where you're working now, you've said it's been much easier health-wise because it's a family business. Yeah. Um, I didn't last long in the sort of the media world. Um, and, and I'm now in the family business, which is easier because most people 
they do know my situation. Um, it's a difficult job. It's quite long hours and quite a bit of stress because I'm essentially running the company. Um, but, as I say, people do know my circumstances, so there's a bit of flexibility for me to come and go. In terms of financial effects, can you tell us what the impact has been financially? Yeah, um, going back again to sort of when I was first told about the Hep C, um, there was that carefree attitude, uh, you know, that I didn't think I was going to be around long. Um, so similar to where my, I wasn't too worried about my studies, I wasn't really worried about money either. Um, I had this sort of feeling that I was going to be dead in a few years anyway, so I might as well enjoy things while, while I was around. So I, I, was, I was very carefree with money. I just spent it, spent it, spent it, spent it. Got into a lot of debt, um, trying to enjoy myself whilst I still could. Uh, I was immature and silly, but that was the way I was. And then, subsequently, you've had difficulties with life insurance? I don't have life insurance. Um, I think I tried once and was rejected, so I've never tried again. And you've struggled with travel insurance? I do get travel insurance, uh, but it's much more expensive than, than normal life insurance, uh, travel insurance. You've received a Skipton Fund payment and some payments from the Scottish scheme. Yeah. What are your views of the scheme? Um, they're helpful, but they're a long way short of what I think should be available. Um, I've not had any difficulties getting those payments. I think my cases have probably been quite uh, cut and dry. But, um, you know, the money has helped. But it's a long way short of giving sort of financial security should I ever become unwell. Um, you know, I have taken on a large mortgage for my family. You know, we've got a nice house. But um, ultimately, if I do become unwell in years to come, um, I can't service that mortgage. Um, my wife has moved down to part-time hours to help uh, look after the kids while they're growing up. So if, if I was to become unwell and unable to work, um, I would worry about her being able to get back into full-time employment. And even with that one income, we can support our mortgage and, and bills. And that is your ongoing major worry? Yeah, it's, it's looking after my family for the future. And that something might happen to you? Yeah even though you've cleared the virus, yeah. you continue to be worried about what your health will be in the future? Yes. As I say, I th I th I'm worried that the foundation stones for future ill health haven't already been laid. Um, you know, I had hep C for 30 years, so who knows? <clears throat> and I don't think there's anybody who, or nobody can tell you what the future holds for somebody who had, has had hepatitis C for 30 years, uh, because it's not happened yet. Those are the questions I have for you. Is there anything else you would like to say? I've got a short statement, which I would make you Please do. Um, I would just like to start by thanking you for the opportunity to tell my story. It's something I never thought I would do, and I've only been inspired to do so by the strong words and commitment to put people like me at the heart of the inquiry. Um, I had given a written statement previously to Penrose, and prior to that I had looked at private legal action, but the outcomes of both of those had ultimately been what seemed like a dead end. So I thank you for giving me and all of us a light to walk towards, albeit there is a long tunnel still ahead. Um, I don't know any other haemophiliacs, or I'm aware of any friends or relatives who have been affected by this scandal. Um, by not knowing any other haemophiliacs, I mean I don't know anybody very well. Um, I'm only acquainted with other members of my local society group. Um, it's therefore been very notable that as part of this process in creating a statement for the inquiry, how closely my narrative seems to follow the experiences of other people like me. I feel it points to either high-level decision or lack of decision-making, or a total systemic failure to prevent or appropriately manage the circumstances that arose in the 1980s and 90s. Either way, innocent lives have been lost, innocent lives have been ruined, and innocent lives have been irrevocably damaged and altered. I fear I will forever live with a sense of trauma about what has happened to me, and fear and trepidation about what lies ahead. 
I may have cleared the virus six years ago, but having ultimately lived with hepatitis C for 30 years with slightly elevated liver function tests, I am not reassured that some damage has not been done. I am also not reassured that three courses of interferon treatment in different guises have not damaged me or added to the burden. It is my personal feeling that costs must have been put ahead of safe treatment. Damage limitation and a not my problem mentality has been put ahead of patients' rights and welfare. Because of this, those of us who still survive will forever bear the burden, as will the loved ones of those who are departed. Those who are no longer with us have paid the ultimate sacrifice of what has been inflicted upon us. And I conclude by wishing you well in delivering the answers that will lead to justice for all of us and ensuring that nothing like this could ever happen again. I'm just going to turn and ask Mr Dawson and Mr O'Neill if there's uh, anything they wish for me to raise. Just a couple of points I'd like me to yeah. ask you about. Um, when you changed over to um, the higher purity factor eight from 19, uh, higher purity factor eight from 1992, um, were your parents told of any risks uh, involved in any of the products, whether that was the higher purity or before that? No, they had no awareness at all of any risks. Can you tell us about the emotional impact this has had on your parents? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, I've not really spoken to them over the years about it because I've tried to let them feel that I'm OK. Um, my parents probably have had a lifetime of stress and worry because of my haemophilia. And I think my, my mum in particular, who was my main carer and also my treatment giver uh, as a young child, she feels a sense of responsibility that possibly by treating me with factor eight. Uh, that she was the one who inflicted hepatitis C on me. Um, of course, that's not the case, but uh, as the person who was actually doing the, the act of the injection, uh, she does feel, I think, a sense of responsibility, uh, which is very unfair on her. Um, when I was diagnosed with my haemophilia, um, the, uh, both my parents were actually questioned as to whether they were all treating me. I'd been in and out of hospital with, with bruising and swollen joints, etc. Um, so I mean, that's, that's just another thing that they've had to deal with over the years, and it's uh, the sort of accumulation of factors has, has probably been quite difficult for them. When you were diagnosed, you were very concerned about passing on the hepatitis C, yeah, and were washing your hands and being very scrupulous in that regard. Mm -hmm. You were also worried in case you'd passed it on to your mum, and yeah. she was subsequently tested as well. And was yeah, clear. yeah, yeah. She, she was tested because there was a concern that it could have been passed on. Uh, my mum was my, my treatment giver up until when I started doing it myself at about the age of 10 or 11. Um, so she had been at risk of needle stick injuries or handling my blood from cuts and bruises and swellings and so on. Um, yeah, I think it would have been awful if she she felt that she had given me hep C and likewise if I had given it back to her it would have been the, possibly the worst set of circumstances we could have imagined. We spoke about your second round of treatment uh, with interferon and you said that you'd, um, it, you'd ended it because it wasn't working. Mm. In your medical records, there's a note where, you said you, where it says you came off it because of the, the side effects. Yes, um, that's inc incorrect. Um, that's probably, actually, to be fair, my, my main complaint of my treatment as an adult. Uh, and I only found this out when I got the medical records through. Um, 
I remember I was getting regular checkups whilst I was on the, the treatment and I was suffering, but there was nothing that would have stopped me from completing that treatment if I thought there was a chance it was going to work. Um, I remember coming into the hospital for one of the regular reviews and it, I think it was put to me that the treatment's still not working and you know, given the side effects that you're suffering, uh, it might be best to stop. So I agreed to it, uh, but I never requested to stop. And in final point, just in relation to your medical records, there's almost nothing from your childhood hospital records. In fact, there are no childhood hospital records, only the GP bits that we Yeah, seen. they seem to be missing or omitted in some way. Um, there was numerous admissions as a young child through the 1980s, um, which I can remember various examples, uh, and there was nothing that I could find in the, the records that I relate to those. Sir. Well, thank you for uh, what has been a very clear and, and frank uh, account of your story, and for giving us, amongst other things, amongst the whole of your story, uh, the insight into being a 15-year-old diagnosed with hepatitis C uh, and seeking to protect your parents whilst your parents were seeking to protect you. Mm. Uh, it's reflective of some other testimony we've heard. It's not all, all the same, but it gives us a very useful, interesting insight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Well, that concludes the evidence for today. Um, now, tell us what we may expect tomorrow. Tomorrow we have two separate anonymous witnesses, uh, followed by Pauline Reid and followed by a further anonymous witness. Thank you. And 10 o'clock tomorrow. 10 o'clock. <laughs>